This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. A husband's lies would send his wife in a downward spiral that would have shocking and devastating consequences for all involved. This is the Janair Gerardo story. Amy, I know you are familiar with today's case. It was the subject of our first book club meeting. The book was irreparable, and it was written by Mark Gerardo, who was Janair's husband. Mark began journaling as a way to process his feelings after the events of this story, and eventually he was encouraged to compile these entries into a book. I think in Mark's view, the book serves as a cautionary tale that he can share with the world. I'd also like to point out that Mark has donated all the proceeds from this book to charity. Amy, you weren't able to make it, but you did read the book. I devoured the book. I read the book probably quicker than I've read a book in a long time. Right. And we had such wonderful discussion during the book club meeting, and I heard perspectives that I had not thought of myself when reviewing and writing. So I'm going to incorporate some of the book club members' points into this discussion today. Amy, I also contacted Mark Gerardo on Facebook with some questions from our book club, which he generously answered. I'll be sharing those at the end of today's episode. Let's begin by introducing Janair Gerardo. Janair was born on December 19, 1970, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, to parents Becky and Earl Cox. And she had a sister named Jill with whom she was not reportedly close at all. I'll get into that a little bit later as well. Janair went to good schools and did well in school. She was well-rounded in terms of being smart, motivated, athletic, and a real go-getter, but she reportedly never felt like she fit in with her peers. Janair also did not appreciate coming, I guess, from uh, this—she came from a strict Catholic home. because She was described by Mark and, I guess, by others as more of a free spirit and kind of a rebel. She loved heavy metal concerts— animals, and more, and she was unashamed of being exactly who she was, no matter what anyone else might think of her. Mark Gerardo met Janair during the summer of 1986, when he was just 18 and Janair was just 16 years old. Janair was working in a Taco Bell and Mark was smitten when he met her there. And while he would see Janair around town, so to speak, the romance between the pair didn't begin until four years later. Janair, being bold and unabashed, finally asked Mark, are you going to ask me out or what? I feel like that's something I would say, just so you know. Mark described Janair as being fearless and willing to speak her mind without care of the consequences, which I think is probably something that was a strength and also a weakness or to her detriment. Mark and Janair married in 1993, but in his book, Mark revealed that he had broken up with Janair for a short time when he met another woman who he became instantly smitten with as well. See, Mark was in college at the time, and there was another student in one of his classes who he became involved with, and he dated this other woman for a short time. And when she broke up with him, he reported feeling devastated. And shortly after this breakup, he ran into Janair, and he said that she looked striking, and he knew that he needed to get her back. He apologized for what he did for hurting her, and she forgave him, giving him a second chance. And I think this point is an important one to keep in mind and perhaps come back to in our discussion later on. After marrying, Mark and Janair moved to a modest apartment in Indianapolis, but worked hard and eventually moved into a house, which they spent many years working on, enjoying it. They did electrical work, they were doing home repairs, but this was work that they both took pride in and enjoyed doing. They both worked in marketing and had good jobs. And Janair's job was so good that in 2001, she supported Mark's decision to open his own marketing firm and go out in business for himself. Mark said that while they were very much in love, they had epic fights and Janair always won. And he became the more passive one in the relationship. He described other red flags, I would say. Let me take a moment here to describe some of these red flags. Do you remember any of them, Amy? Yeah, actually, in the book, I was surprised at how many times it seemed that there were situations that would have concerned most people. But 
I think we would all say things like that looking back at our past. When you're in the middle of something, you don't really notice the things as much as retroactive. Sure. Uh, on the outside looking in too, but uh, some of these red flags were big ones for me. One of them was that Janair did not want Mark to see his friends. Janair didn't have friends. He said, Mark said that, or, well, this is according to Mark too, and in fairness, this is Mark's perspective, but he said that Janair had one friend. Um, they had a fight. They never kind of made up. And he said, other than that, she didn't have friends and she was happy with that. She didn't understand why Mark wanted to spend time with anyone other than her. She said that's what marriage was about and commitment. It should just be the two of them. That seems problematic. I think it I think it absolutely seems problematic and it's isolating behavior, which is not healthy. You need other social bonds and social attachments. Mark said that Janair was also close to being a hoarder, if you recall that. She had stacks of magazines, knickknacks, and tons of other possessions that she would not part with. And it became like a source of contention because he would try to clean up or get rid of some of them. But and Mark said, essentially, every time they move, they had to pay for extra for movers to move these items. And then they also had to pay extra for storage units so that Janair could hold on to these items. I also think it shows how Mark was very passive. Yes. In the relationship. And there's a lot of evidence of that. Yeah. He admittedly became the, the passive one in the relationship, for better or for worse. Nonetheless, you know, actually, sorry, one more thing that I want to point out that I didn't write in my script. I do remember... There was an incident with Mark and Janair where Janair wrote a letter to Mark's family member on his behalf, you know, asking for something. It was, I can't remember exactly what the context was, but she had no problem, you know, faking it. And when he kind of said, you wrote that letter and pretended to be me, she blew it off, kind of dismissed it. Like, yeah, so what? Um, that's also, that was a red flag for me. Nonetheless, Mark said that they had a lot of good times together. They explored bookshops, restaurants, coffee shops. They loved doing outdoor activities together, and they doted on their dogs. But Janair lost a high-level marketing job and had trouble rebounding. According to Mark, Janair lost a lot of her identity, her pride, and her self-esteem when she lost that job. Understandably, I think. What did Mark do? Well, he had a perfect solution. He said he hired Janair, but it did not go well. Many of Mark's employees threatened to quit if Janair was going to stay. I also think that it's not healthy for a couple like that when Janair had no outside connections. So now her whole life is Mark, where at least she used to have work separate from him. Absolutely. So Janair worked for him. Um, he did keep Janair on. And what happened was a couple of the employees left, one or two stayed on. That's the way it shook out. But the two also moved into a much bigger and nicer home in Carmel, which is an affluent suburb of Indianapolis. And while they loved it there, they were in over their heads once the recession hit because Mark was working from home, but business was slow. By 2011, Mark had owned his own business for 10 years when an interesting opportunity came up. Someone recommended Mark for a creative director position in Greenville, South Carolina, he was interested, and Janair was. Janair was pretty much in. She seemed like the type who would get up and move like for a new opportunity. Well, she has no ties to anyone. No, but I also think she liked the idea. Like, I think they were adventurous in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, that was one of their connections. Like, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll embark on a new adventure here. We'll start a new life somewhere. And I think that was part of their dynamic. And that's just what they did. They moved to South Carolina. And while his relationship with Janair, he said, had been strained for some time before that, Mark said that the next six years were the happiest of his marriage. But South Carolina was temporary. They never intended to stay there for good. They had their sights set on Denver and other places. I can understand why they'd want to go to Denver, right? I mean, you know how I feel about Denver. Right. Me too. I have my sights set on Denver also. It's me too. Then in 2017, the University of Delaware was hiring for a marketing position. Mark had been looking around at different positions in different states and he said that he thought this position was absolutely perfect for him. So he reached out to Meredith Chapman, who was in charge of hiring for the position. And she responded, inviting him to an interview for the position. And when Mark got this job, he had no idea that it would change everything in his life. Mark moved to Delaware to begin this job in November 2017, while Janair stayed behind to finish leasing out their place and settle their affairs. The plan would put Mark in Delaware alone for approximately 45 days. They had done this before as well. They had spent time apart when moving and embarking on new jobs. So neither one of them thought this was an incredibly big deal. I'm surprised that Janair is okay with that time apart because it seems like she's quite dependent on Mark. 
That surprised me too. Uh, but apparently it was a part of their dynamic. Uh, Janair would like, you know, settle the affairs, close up, Mark would go and start. So, I mean, not that they had done that often, but once or twice before. Though Mark was initially very apprehensive about working for someone so much younger than him because Meredith, his new boss and who he would directly report to was just 32 years old. He said that after spending a few minutes in a room with Meredith, he understood exactly how she had achieved so much at a young age and felt inspired by her leadership. She was young. Meredith led the marketing team. She taught classes. She gave inspirational talks. She even ran for local politics. I I believe it was Senate, but she lost, but not by a lot. I mean, she did quite well. She was very accomplished at a very young age. At first, just a professional crush, according to Mark. It quickly developed into a real-life crush. And it was mutual early on. It seemed like Meredith was smitten with Mark as well, right? Yes, it was. It was mutual very early on. So what happened was Meredith invited Mark for a friendly drink. But on that first meeting, Mark said he opened up to Meredith, finding her so easy to talk to and just saying things to her that he wouldn't have thought he'd be saying to, you know, a stranger, much less his boss. And Mark started to develop feelings for Meredith, but he was confused because he loved Janair, but he was drawn to Meredith. He said that Meredith was very positive. She was very complimentary about the kind of person he was, whereas Janair had not been, according to Mark. Mark said that Janair was demeaning. She used derogatory terms to describe him. And, you know, according to Mark, she never complimented him. She didn't think he was a good leader. Meredith was also married at the time and had been so for about nine years. But Meredith told Mark that the last three years were only for appearances. She and her husband were both active in politics, and I don't think the optics of divorce would look good. Mark and Meredith began a whirlwind romance that escalated very quickly, Amy. They were meeting in secret and spending a lot of time together. They had each professed their love for one another, and they were making plans to leave their spouses, even though Mark said he still loved Janair. But Mark said he saw the potential for a life he hadn't known with Janair. But Janair was packing and getting ready for her move to Delaware because she knew nothing about the burgeoning relationship between her husband and Meredith. But when Janair arrived, she could sense that Mark was distant and she instantly suspected another woman. And specifically, she asked Mark, it's Meredith, isn't it? To which Mark said no. He adamantly denied the affair, but Janair knew better. I'm surprised he denied it because knowing what we know about Janair, I would think there's no way you could lie to a woman like that. Yeah. Me too. But no, he he denied it immediately. You know, Janair's smart woman and suspecting that her husband was having an affair with Meredith and with him constantly denying it, Janair took matters into her own hands. She began recording Mark unbeknownst to him. Amy, do you remember how she did this? Didn't she put a tracker on his car? That was one of the ways. She recorded his phone calls, but she also put a, there was a microphone on his, I'm sorry, I remember now. She put microphones on his clothes. I know. Right? She sewed it into his clothes. That is absolutely correct. She sewed recording devices into his work jackets. And then when he would come home, she would take them out, download the contents and replace the device again for the next day. She was able to hear exactly what was going on between Mark and Meredith and the intimate conversations they were having about how excited they were and how happy they could be together and their future. She did also, you were right, Amy, you said earlier, she also put a tracker on Mark and Meredith's car. She installed them herself, and she hired a company to clone his phone as well. She did a couple other things that we are going to discuss just a little bit later on. But on New Year's Eve, pressing him about what was wrong, Mark told Janair he wanted his independence and that he wanted out of the relationship. He said he immediately regretted it, though. He would spend the next month or so trying to walk that back. But Janair knew, and she was gathering proof, pressing him to tell her the truth. But Mark would not confess his relationship with Meredith to Janair, despite the fact that she kept asking. So Janair didn't reveal yet, if I just can't recall this part, Janair didn't reveal yet to Mark that she was had all this information on him. She was kind of like waiting to see how far the lies would go. Absolutely correct. It was Valentine's Day when Janair confronted him with the evidence she had collected. And Mark was forced to admit the truth at this point because she had the conversations. She had evidence point blank. He told Janair that he was in love with Meredith, but he agreed to see a marriage counselor with Janair because he said that he was torn and he still loved Janair as well. Just to point out, Mark was being recorded, but he didn't know how. So on one of these occasions when they were getting ready to head to marriage counseling, Mark discovered the listening device in his jacket, and he was totally shocked. 
But now he finally understood how Janair seemed to know every single one of the conversations intimately. He could never figure that out. Mark said that he told the marriage counselor about this, and the counselor told Janair that this was really unhealthy behavior and she needed to stop, which reportedly upset and infuriated Janair. I think she felt like they were, you know, ganging up on her, and, and she didn't, you know, she didn't feel that he understood why she had to do this. Does she realize how wrong it is to do what she was doing, though? No. I don't think Janair realized it was wrong. I think Janair, from her point of view, had to do this because her husband was being unfaithful and would not tell her the truth. I think Janair felt very justified in what she was doing. Mark also said that he realized that he wanted marriage counseling too, but he, at that point, wasn't looking for a fix to their marriage. He really wanted a way to prepare Janair for their inevitable separation. The listening devices... The phone cloning and the tracking were only part of the picture, though, Amy, because Janair also contacted Meredith's husband and made him aware of the affair, which led to the separation of Meredith and her husband. You know what's interesting about that? If you think about it strategically, I would expect it would lead to their separation. And if she didn't want Mark to leave her for Meredith, that was probably, you know, that that move probably had the reverse effect than she wanted. I also think at this point she wants to do anything to hurt Mark, to hurt the situation. And maybe she also thought that Meredith's husband would beg for her back and they could go to counseling and see that they want to stay together. Fair point. Even more detrimental, though, Janair wrote to Mark and Meredith's boss, who had initiated an investigation into an inappropriate relationship between the two. So now their jobs were in jeopardy as well. Yeah, I feel like she's playing really dirty here. Oh, yeah. I'm not. I, listen, I don't think what Mark is doing is right, but I don't think that justifies Janair's behavior. Well, also, I mean, again, I think... It's not logical thinking, because if it was logical, I would think, well, he's the earner. If his job's in jeopardy, then we have no financial stability. So, again, this is clearly she's not she's not thinking clearly. Meanwhile, Mark continued to live with Janair and Janair began seeing a divorce coach because she was starting to realize that their marriage was dissolving and that this was happening. Janair was very worried about finances again. So that's why I didn't think it was so practical, because she didn't have a job and Janair said that she didn't want to work anymore. She was upset that Meredith was replacing her and taking her life. She was very resentful, but she wasn't the only one. In a heated encounter between Mark and Janair, Mark discovered yet another listening device in his clothing after Janair had promised that she would stop recording him. Mark said that he got really angry, which did not usually happen. He said that he yelled at Janair and even flipped a coffee table. In response to this incident, Mark said that Janair threatened to jump off their building, but she did not do it. And at this point, Mark insisted Janair see a mental health professional and tell her family what was going on. Janair agreed. That's another red flag here, you know? It sounds like this is the first time she's threatening to harm herself. Yes, I believe this was the absolute first time. And I think that Mark said that there was never any indicators before that Janair would self-harm or harm anyone else. Shortly after this happened, though, Janair told Mark that she would agree to a divorce, but it was going to be on her terms. And here were the terms. Specifically, she wanted him to financially support her for a while. At first, she had said indefinitely, but Mark said that, no, she had to find work eventually and support herself. You know, Janair was very smart. She was talented, well-educated. She was 47. I don't think he envisioned a life where he would support someone, you know, forever, which I think is fair. But he did say that he would support her for quite a long time and generously. She said that while they were separating, Mark would have to continue to spend time with her doing hikes, going to restaurants, and caring for their dogs, but that he could also continue to see Meredith as long as he was honest about it. I think it's strange. I understand the financial part. I understand the caring for the dogs, but it seems strange that part of the deal is that he has to spend quality time with her. It's almost like she's just in such denial about what's going on. I thought it was odd, too. I thought it was actually very odd. One of the other things that she insisted, and I think this, I I don't know if this was to hurt Mark or because she really wanted, but they had a dog and a cat, and Mark was really attached to the dog. So was Janair, but she insisted that Mm -hmm. she would get full custody of both animals. And Mark was really upset at first. He said, can I at least have some visitation with the dog? I think the dog's name was Huck. And she said, absolutely not. And I, I don't know if she saw this as a pressure Like, he won't want to leave the animals. Mark said he eventually agreed, though, because he realized he didn't really have an option here. Meanwhile, Meredith got a new job at Villanova, a good job. And she began house hunting while Mark interviewed for other jobs and looked for apartments as well. Mark said that Janair was being 
pretty normal and pleasant, and he thought that things were going well, but he would find out that he was quite mistaken. Janair was making recordings of her own anger at Mark and Meredith, along with the recordings of Mark and Meredith. She was transcribing her recordings into written notebooks, but even more so, Janair had purchased a firearm in March 2018 and was attending the range to practice. Mark said he had no idea about any of this. He thought things were progressing smoothly, mostly, and Janair had never liked firearms before. Also, you know, when pointing out, like, it wasn't at odd that, you, you know, Janair wanted to spend time together. He said that he just felt like he was being, you know, a nice guy transitioning out, trying to end things. They had been together for over 25 years, trying to end things well. It almost sounded like reading the book. In hindsight, it was almost too easy, too good to be true that she was making it so easy for him. I think so. I, I think I, I would agree. Mark had also found a new job. And he and Janair, again, just proceeded with their divorce and things proceeded to go smoothly. But on April 23rd, 2018, Meredith was headed home from her new job at Villanova and she snapped a beautiful picture of her on the campus looking so happy. I saw the picture. Meanwhile, on that day, Mark and Janair had planned to meet for dinner that evening and continue the conversation about the logistics of their divorce. But when Mark got to the restaurant, Janair was not there and she sent a text saying, I'll be late. Then a text, I'm not coming. And finally, a text message, a picture. It was a picture of trash outside Meredith's home and what looked like a condom perhaps in the trash with Janair commenting, quote, you fucked her or she's cheating on you, followed by a few more texts. And Mark said, realizing what was going on, he became alarmed. The text that followed said, you ruined my life. I hope you never find happiness. And finally, by Mark. Mark was very worried, and so he quickly left and headed to Meredith, expecting that maybe Janair had confronted Meredith. He had no idea what situation he was going to walk into. When he got there, no one answered, so he went to the back of the house, looked in, and saw Meredith face down on the kitchen floor. Mark panicked, running to her and seeing blood on her. So he ran outside and yelled to a neighbor to call 911. I don't know if he didn't have his phone with him or if he was just in a panic. He didn't understand what was going on, he said. But when he came back, he said that he was absolutely shocked to see Janair laying motionless on the floor. Mark said that he just instantly said, baby, what have you done? Police and first responders arrived on the scene and someone told Mark that both Janair and Meredith were dead. A shocked Mark was taken to police headquarters, though, because he was the prime suspect in these murders. But the police investigated and found pretty quickly a 357 Magnum firearm with two bullets missing. They were able to piece together what happened. Janair was wearing all black and the firearm was found near her. Police determined that she had broken into Meredith's home, waited for Meredith to arrive home for the day, and when she did, Janair shot Meredith to death and then turned the gun on herself, resulting in both women's deaths. Can you believe before this book, that you didn't know this case? No, I I really could not believe it. I mean, we see, unfortunately, cases like this aren't that uncommon in the world of true crime, meaning love triangles that end in, you know, people dying by suicide and people also murdering a mistress or a spouse. But this case, I was, yes, I was very surprised that I hadn't heard of it. This seemed to be the ultimate act of revenge because Janair didn't kill Mark. Instead, she took two people from him that meant the most. You know what I wonder, Megan? It's clear that this was premeditated because there was almost like a calm before the storm. Absolutely. Like she started playing really nice. But that picture that she sent, do you think that seeing the condom in the garbage was the catalyst? And that's why it happened, had to happen at that moment because she was like snooping around and that angered her? Or do you think that she was just sending that to him as like, oh, and now this too? I think it was premeditated, planned. She had also uh, been reportedly seen scouting out in Meredith's house by a neighbor another on another occasion. I think she planned this. Yes, I, I think it was planned. And I think that was just, you know, just kind of fueled the fire, so to speak. After the double shooting, Mark was in a total state of shock, as you can imagine. His world having been turned upside down and the story becoming a media sensation where all parties became villains. And I want to discuss this in our conclusions, our thoughts about each party's culpability. Mark had to adjust to a new world in which both the women that he loved in his life were gone. He was depicted as a monster, and he said he now became obsessed 
with finding out exactly what Janair had been doing. And he was shocked again because going through all of Janair's computer records, phone records, bank accounts, he found hundreds of hours of recordings. He found secret credit cards, a lock picking kit, DNA testing for clothing and more. He was surprised to find the GPS devices on his and Meredith's car were installed by Janair herself. She had been stalking, in essence, you know, I think that's an appropriate term, both Meredith and Mark for several weeks. But Amy, one of the most shocking events was a recording on the evening of April 6, 2018. This was the night that Mark told Janair he was absolutely filing for divorce. In this video, Mark is asleep on the couch and Janair recorded him, but it was dark and there was a noise. It was a click that Mark couldn't identify immediately until a friend told Mark that it was the sound of a revolver firing. Wasn't she also corresponding with a private investigator? Yes, yeah, she was. He was also helping. Didn't he call him as well? Like he was he started digging through everything he could. Yes. He started Mark started going through everything. So he was not only doing that, he contacted her therapist and met with her therapist. It was very hard for him to understand this escalation. And as he struggled to put the pieces back together, that's when he began journaling and eventually decided to write this story in a novel. Um, he also cooperated for another podcast, Bad, Bad Thing. I re remember before I said that all the proceeds were donated to an organization. It was an organization that rescues golden retrievers because Mark and Janair first adopted Mesa, a golden who they considered their baby. And eventually when Mesa passed, they adopted Huck, uh, another golden, and Gypsy, their cat. Both of the animals remained with Mark until they eventually passed. One of the sad things, or one of the other odd bits, was that in a letter to Mark, Janair asked that Gypsy the cat be put to sleep because Gypsy would not be able to live without her. I found that part so disturbing, but didn't Janair's family fight really hard because that was Janair's wishes? Didn't they end up doing that to the cat? No, Mark wound up with the cat. Okay, He refused to give the cat over and he said something to the effect of Janair's made enough decisions about the lives that are going to end. So he kept Gypsy and he kept Huck and they both lived long lives. Mark moved to L.A., about, I think, about a year and a half after this event, where he is the founder and CEO of his own marketing business again. He adopted another golden retriever, and he said that he doesn't take any day for granted anymore. He's open about his story, and as I said, he was willing to answer questions from us. These were the questions that we came up with during our Patreon book club, our first meeting. So we decided on a couple of topics that we would ask Mark. We didn't want to inundate him, but there were a couple important things that we wanted to know, and he was kind enough to answer those questions for us. Before we get to those questions, let's try to figure out the how and the why this happened. Janair wrapped her whole identity around her marriage and her husband. That, I think, is clear. She had no other social bonds whatsoever. She did have, you know, work, but after work, she didn't seem to have bonds. She was not close with her family. Remember I said that she wasn't close with her sister, Jill? Mark could never understand this, but she seemed to really dislike Jill. And if her parents visited and brought Jill, she would ask why. She did not seem to want to have much to do with her sister for reasons that are unclear. I believe that when she felt the only bond that she had breaking, she just simply could not cope with this. That sounds a little bit, obviously, social bond theory, but it sounds like quintessential strain theory, doesn't it? Well, of course, yeah. I mean, but it is. This is the ultimate stressor, though. When we talk about strain sometimes, this is exactly what strain was developed to address. Remember, loss of positively valued stimuli, failure to achieve your goals. She's losing her marriage, her family. This is the ultimate stressor for Janair. And she lacked the proper coping mechanisms to deal with all of that strain. She absolutely did. I also believe Janair suffered from mental health issues that had long persisted as we talked about some of those, you know, red flags. But, you know, they manifested over the years and she didn't receive any treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, Mark's passive personality did not help. And his lies to Janair about his relationship with Meredith really triggered her in ways that he couldn't have imagined. Had he told the truth, I don't know that this would have ended the way it did. I, th I think even if he told her the truth, she would have had a similar reaction. Mm -hmm. But I think perhaps if he... I don't want to blame Mark at all because he's been through enough. But he even says so in his book that he feels as if maybe he should have been able to see some of the signs of her mental health deteriorating and perhaps try to get help. Absolutely. I mean, I guess it's not if he told the truth. You can't speculate. You're right. But had he maybe ended the marriage, though, 
without a relationship with someone else, that might have changed the course. I don't think he would have because I think he was as dependent on her as she was to him. That's exactly what I think. And in fact, I don't know if you recall, but at one point, Mark actually said, I don't know that if things didn't work out with Meredith, I wouldn't have gone running back to Janair. Yep. And I think that's probably what would have happened. Yeah. I mean, he says throughout the whole time he's having this affair, he's there was one point where he even was considering ending it with Meredith to stay with Janair, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. And you asked me about Janair realizing what she was doing was wrong, but I don't think she thought it was wrong at all. She felt justified and she felt that this was not her fault. She felt that Mark and Meredith were the victims and she had no choice. So what does this sound like, Amy? Techniques of neutralization, denying the victim. That's exactly what it is. Denying responsibility. Denying injury. It's, it's all of it. Yeah. And I think that this is a clear case of uh, techniques of neutralization here. In the end, this was a tragedy all around for everyone. I spoke to, again, the book club members and the opinions about blame and character flaws really varied. I thought it was very interesting to hear from many people. So some saw Mark as the bad guy for cheating and then lying to Janair. And then what they said was leading her on. So they felt that this staying together with her, doing couple things together, sharing dinners, they felt that this was leading her on. Did you feel that way at all? Yes. I don't think he was doing it to be malicious. I think he truly believed that it was helping her. Yeah. But I think it was providing some false hope to Janair. Yes. And he, yeah, I do think he was, you know, feeding into that idea with her. Okay. Yeah. No, I think so as well. I think he, again, I don't think it was malicious, but yeah. Others saw Janair as highly narcissistic and emotionally abusive. What'd you think about that? I could see that. Yeah. I do see her as a victim in this story. There are a lot of victims in the story. I know Janair is the offender. Yeah, but we always say, oftentimes victim and offender are one and the same. Janair's both. Yep. I see her as a victim and an offender as well. I did see yeah. narcissistic personality traits, absolutely. Yes, narcissistic personality traits for sure. Um, do you see any other personality disorders? With Janair? Mm -hmm. No, I saw, I see narcissistic. I didn't really see like mania or manic or anything like that. Yeah. No, yeah. I think, I think narcissistic is what I would go with. And mm -hmm. others in the group saw Meredith as the villain for breaking up a marriage. And some thought that she enjoyed the drama of it, which was not something I considered. I don't think that's fair because that's blaming the victim because she is clearly the victim who lost her life in this. So I 100% disagree that she deserves any blame. Blame for being murdered? No. And I don't think it was the drama of the relationship. I think she truly fell in love with Mark yeah. and thought this was, you know, the man for her. I mean, I never condone an affair. So mm -hmm. do I think that was wrong? Yeah, I think that was wrong. But no, I certainly wouldn't blame her for any of the events. Yeah, I, I think there's other ways they could have handled it. If they were falling in love, I think perhaps the better move would have been to talk to each of their spouses and separate before starting a relationship. But mm -hmm. right. We can always look back and say, what if, you know, on the podcast that I listened, the therapist, of course, said it didn't have to be a choice between Janair and Meredith. Mark should have chose himself and he could have chose to be alone and figure things out. I don't think that was an option for Mark, but it's a fair point. Very fair point. But I yes. do not see that as an option. In the end, Mark Gerardo blamed himself and Janair for what happened, and he's tried to make amends and make peace with it. He hopes that the book will help others struggling with the same issues before a tragedy like this occurs. I saw another interview that Mark did where I think it was actually on um, 2020, because this case was on 2020. And I think he was asked whether he's forgiven Janair. And he said, for doing what she did to him, yes. For doing what she did to Meredith, no. Which I thought was an interesting point as well. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the, you know, how I put together and, and kind of deconstructed the behavior and the theories that I thought, am I missing anything you think, Amy? Possibly control balance. How so? Because she was, I think maybe Janair, I think she had such a control on Mark and she feared that she was losing control because she was actually going through with this divorce. So that could have been a trigger for her. Yeah, that could have been. She was losing all the control in the relationship. Mm -hmm. All right. At the end of the day, like I said, it was an all around tragedy. I do hope that Mark's book will affect, you know, the way people think about these things. I, it had a tremendous impact on me. I felt compelled to cover mm -hmm. this case. Yep. And I'd also like to end with the questions that we asked Mark and his answers. So there were two questions. The first one we asked was, how long did it take you to realize that you might be able to date again? 
were you apprehensive about putting yourself out there? Because people wondered, like, well, how would this impact his future relationships? And here's what Mark had to say. A year and a half after the tragedy in 2018, I decided to move to California to start a new life. I quit my job and sold or gave away everything I owned. I had no idea what I was going to do. I just knew that I had to start over. I had no intentions or desires to date. However, shortly after I arrived in San Diego, I met a woman at a networking event and we became good friends. Going out to dinner, talking, it was easy and exactly what I needed. Before I knew it, we had been kind of, quote, dating for a year And I finally realized after more than a few subtle hints, she wasn't getting what she needed. We had never been intimate. I still just had zero interest in that department. But I was getting what I needed most, friendship. My therapist told me that wasn't fair to her. I needed to let her go and continue to work on myself. Quote, you need to date lots of different people, she said. So very carefully and kindly, I ended the relationship and reluctantly joined an online dating app. Eight months later, I met the most incredible woman I have ever known. Empathetic, understanding, nurturing, brilliant, independent. I could go on. We have been inseparable for a little over a year. Who knows what tomorrow could bring? So that was the answer to the first question. Very honest. Good for him. I'm glad. I'm glad he found happiness. I am too. I think, you know, I think he deserves to find happiness after what he suffered. The second question Do you have any ideas now, after time has passed and you've been working on deeper understanding, why you stayed with Janair for so long despite many red flags? I thought this was a good question, too. Can I can I guess what he says? Sure. He did not know at the time that they were red flags. Let's see. And he loved her. Yeah, I did love her. Despite the challenges from the start of my marriage, I just think I was too close to it to see them, too blindly in love to listen to friends who saw what I could not. Perhaps more accurately, I didn't connect the dots along the way or didn't understand what the dots meant. Early on, I guess, I rationalized her somewhat antisocial and eventually more erratic behavior as sporadic idiosyncrasies. As she began to isolate herself more and more from friends and family, I felt responsible for taking care of her and hoped she would someday find the spark she once had. In many ways, I know that by not dealing with the issues or getting her help, I was actually enabling her. It took meeting Meredith to realize how unhealthy and unbalanced my marriage was. There are so many things I wish I would have done differently over the course of my marriage, and certainly at the end of it. While I am now very focused on the future, I do find myself leaning on the lessons I learned, determined to live a more honest and balanced life. That from Mark Gerardo. Thank you so much, Megan. Those are really insightful answers. I'm glad you were able to ask him those questions. And I thank Mark for participating. I appreciate it as well. I thought it was very considerate of him. He was curious as to the feedback from the group. He was open. He was receptive. And he remains so. So we thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for listening to today's episode. And we'll see you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga, edited by Jose Alfonso. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash womenincrime. Sources for today's episode include Irreparable by Mark Gerardo, an episode of 2020, and discussions with our True Crime Patreon book club members.